Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Cooperative Hall of Fame induction ceremony. My name is Rich Larochelle, and I chair the board of directors of the Cooperative Development Foundation, your host for this evening. Thank you for being here to honor five truly outstanding cooperators. And also to support the continued good work of the Cooperative Development Foundation. It's Thank you. It's fitting that an, ev an event to recognize the lifetime accomplishments of these five wonderful inductees, that this should also benefit cooperative development. For 79 years, CDF has promoted community, economics, and social development through cooperatives. We'll be celebrating CDF's 80th anniversary next year. Look for some very special events coming your way. But our work could not be done without the support of all of you in this room and so many great organiza cooperative organizations around the country. Today, I particularly want to acknowledge our Hall of Fame sponsors, CFC. <laughs> CoBank. Momentous Capital, Na <laughs> thank you. The National Cooperative Bank, National Co-op Grocers, and also NRECA. I also want to thank our table sponsors. They are listed in your beautiful programs at your tables. We, as we are honoring lifetime co-op heroes, we also want to welcome emerging leaders. These people are our future, and we have 33 co -op le emerging co-op leaders here with us tonight from the Cooperative Leaders and Scholars Program. Can you all thank you. Let's thank them. and from the International Cooperative Alliance Youth Leadership Exchange and the Young Scholars Initiative. <laughs> Thanks to the wonderful sponsors that brought these individuals from around the world to be here with us for a week of learning and networking. Now, let's start our meal together with a moment of reflection that's our tradition. I'm gonna welcome Margaret Bao to the stage to give the invocation. <laughs> Margaret is well known by many of us as a cooperative development specialist for the U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Development Cooperative Service. Margaret. It is good to be here tonight together. Let us take a moment to quiet ourselves. We gather in gratitude for the life's work of our fellow cooperators, Helena, Linda, Leslie, Sheldon, and Maurice. Though they come from different paths of life and worked in different sectors, they each devoted their lives to making the world a better place. No doubt, they each encountered obstacles, shortages of resources, and many, many meetings. But they persevered. They believed in the cooperative values of self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity. Their decades of work embody love in action. 
and so together we bless the food we are about to receive, a gift of the earth grown by farmers and prepared by many hands. May this food and the stories of this evening inspire all of us to deepen our commitment to building a better world through cooperative action. Amen. Thank you very much, Margaret, for that wonderful invocation. Now the time has come to introduce tonight's MC. If I could get your attention, let's quiet ourselves. I'd like to welcome to the stage Audrea Powell. Audrea, come on up. Audrea is the president and CEO of the Cooperative Home Care Associates. The Cooperative Home Care Associates is a worker-owned home care co company based in the Bronx, New York. CHCA launched operations in 1985 with 12 home care workers. Today, the cooperative, with Audrea's leadership, has more than 1,700 workers, and close to half of them are owners of the cooperative. See <laughs> CHCA trains and places home care workers into essential caregiving jobs, and the cooperative is committed to continuously advocating for and impacting job quality as a means to delivering quality care and improving the lives of workers, members, and care recipients. Tonight, we're priv privileged to have a true cooperative leader who has made a real difference in her community and her example has shown across the country to other home care cooperatives. Let's welcome Audrea. Thank you, Rich. It is an honor to be here tonight. We come together from many cooperative sectors and many parts of the world to honor our co-op heroes. The Cooperative Hall of Fame is about recognizing people who are and were committed to using cooperatives as humane and equitable business, to give an economic voice to workers, consumers, farmers, and small businesses. We honor the commitment and dedication of those who understand how cooperatives can, meet, can make a meaningful and lasting difference in the lives of members, of workers, of customers, and of the communities in which they serve. We hope to take away from this event inspiration and a renewed energy for our own work advancing cooperatives and inclusion as a better way of doing business and to help ensure all are included and can benefit from a truly inclusive economy. One of the highlights of the Hall of Fame is the reunion of past inductees. It is an annual gathering of an impressive group. Let's recognize all of the members of the Hall of Fame that are here tonight. As I call your name, please join us on stage for a picture. So I'm gonna call your names, but I can't see because these lights are killing me, okay? <laughs> so please, bear with me. <laughs> Andy Riker. <laughs> Ann Hoyt. <laughs> Ann Reynolds. Barry Silver. Dan Waddle. Everett Dabrinsky. Jessica Gordon Nemhard. Judy Z. Watts. <laughs> K. 
Karen Zimbelman. <laughs> Larry Blanchard. <laughs> Marilyn Scholl. <laughs> Mike Mercer. <laughs> Paul Hazen. Rich, where'd you go? Rich LaRochelle. <laughs> Rosemary Mahoney. <laughs> Terry Lewis. And William Nelson. Did I miss any other inductees who are here? Mm, that's the only one that I got. Are there more inductees? Martin Lowry. Thank you. Did I miss anyone else? Sorry, Martin. Good, good. Okay, let's give these amazing co-op heroes a round of applause. You are all our heroes, and we're thrilled to have so many of you with us tonight. The complete roster of the Hall of Fame members is at the back of your program. Please enjoy your meal. We'll be back with the 2023 induction ceremony after dinner is served. Enjoy your meal. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry to interrupt your meal, but we have an amazing night set up. So let's get back to the program. All right, welcome back everyone. It's time to get down to the business of the evening. Tonight, we pay tribute to five outstanding leaders, Linda Leakes, <laughs> Leslie Mead, <laughs> Sheldon Peterson, Maurice Smith, and Helena Wilson. Each of these folks is a true cooperative hero. Their contributions have made a lasting mark on cooperatives and the lives of people and communities in which they worked. We thank the selection committee and the board of directors of NCBA CLUSA for their work in bringing these heroes to us. Tonight, we honor each inductee inv individually with a video and invite words from the nominating organizations and the inductees themselves. After the video presentation, we will then ask the inductee and the nominating organization to come to the podium. Let's get started. <laughs> Woo! The Hall of Fame recognizes outstanding cooperators. This year, we continue a new tradition recognizing those who have gone unrecognized for too long. I have to say, I was so inspired to see this award added last year and was honored to have a CHCA colleague participate on the selection committee that chose Ella Baker as the first unsung hero to recognize this award. Ella Baker was always a hero of mine. And tonight, keeping the tradition going, we honor Helena Wilson as our unsung cooperative hero. Please turn your attention to the video honoring Helena Wilson.
Elena Wilson, 2023 Unsung Cooperative Hero, was a selfless and tireless crusader for co-ops, a co-op organizer, educator, and advocate. Born in Denver in 1897, she was conscious of a benevolent streak from an early age. She moved to Chicago as an adult at a time when Chicago was experiencing a period of migration of African Americans from the South. After moving to Chicago, she found an outlet for her compassion, joining several social and civic movements. Helping the migration was the national distribution of the Chicago Defender, a black newspaper distributed throughout the South by Pullman Railroad Porters residing in Chicago. After a 12 year struggle led by A. Philip Randolph, the Pullman Porters successfully organized the first union for black workers, the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters, which brought the nearly 20,000 members, including maids, better working conditions and pay. Helena Wilson was the wife of Porter Benjamin Wilson. She saw firsthand the benefits of unionizing and economic democracy. Soon after the founding of the BSCP, female Pullman employees and relatives of male union members formed the Women's Economic Councils, officially recognized as the International Ladies Auxiliary to the BSCP in 1938. The drive behind Wilson's efforts is devotion towards a greater cause, something that has been important to Wilson from girlhood. And no one expresses this better than Wilson herself. Quote, during that period of study, the members learned of the many advantages common to the cooperative movement. They learned how to get quality and value for the money being spent they learned how to put an end to ruthless exploitation, how to lower prices, and how to shorten the distance between the middleman and the ultimate consumer, who happens to be themselves. They learned that the future well-being of themselves and their offspring, that the success of the enterprise depends upon the consolidated efforts of the entire group. Alongside BSCP President A. Philip Randolph, Wilson spearheaded the auxiliary's interest in consumer education and cooperatives through promotion and development of study groups for auxiliary chapters nationwide. Led by Wilson, the Chicago Ladies Auxiliary formed several study groups on consumers' cooperatives. And besides Wilson's hometown of Chicago, the study clubs emerged in 16 other cities across the nation. Wilson traveled the country, representing the voice of Ladies Auxiliary alongside the male leaders such as A. Philip Randolph and M. E. Webster. Events that were highlighted in Black Press, an important partner in union, cooperative, and civil rights movements. Her work took her to auxiliary chapters in cities such as Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, Detroit, Michigan, New York, New York, Dayton, Ohio, St. Paul, Minnesota, and Helena, Montana, as well as up to Montreal when the Brotherhood and Auxiliary expanded to Canada. According to Paula Pfeffer, at the Ladies Auxiliary, Wilson found she could be of real service in a cause that was seeking to liberate a much exploited people. She worked to help draw attention to injustice in many areas, including food, housing, and working conditions. She worked to help show how cooperatives and other democratic institutions could help address the needs of black communities in ways that did not exploit, but that empowered them. She urged passage of important congressional legislation, often at the Metropolitan Community Church, a historic landmark in Bronzeville on Chicago's South Side that was one of the independent churches that governed themselves democratically with a dedication towards community service rather than religious denomination. Helena Wilson deserves recognition as an unsung co-op hero, not just because she was one of the few black women to be elected to serve on the National Consumer Cooperative Council in the mid 1900s, and not just because she helped to start and support at least 17 co-op study groups in major cities in the US and Canada, but also because of her 30 year contribution of articles and pamphlets in the Black Worker magazine on cooperative economics and consumer co-op strategies. And especially because of the collaborations and projects she organized between organized labor and the cooperative movement. She helped labor movement to understand their power as consumers and the power of democratic control over work and business ownership that cooperatives enable. She argued that it's cooperative business ownership that we should be teaching our young people. I salute Helena Wilson, especially for being instrumental in raising the awareness of cooperatives in black communities for decades.
No race can be said to be another's equal that cannot or will not protect its own interests. This new order can be brought about once the Negro acknowledges the wisdom in uniting his forces and pooling his funds for the common good of all. Other races have gained great wealth and great power by following this simple rule. And it is hoped someday that the Negro will do the same. For all her work and contributions to cooperatives, as an educator, organizer, and leader, we honor Helena Wilson with induction into the Cooperative Hall of Fame. I would like to invite Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard to the stage to say a few words about Helena Wilson. Good evening, everybody. How are you? So, Margaret Lund wherever she is, <laughs> first suggested to me that the Hall of Fame should have an unsung hero category because of all the co-op heroes I resurrected in my research on black cooperators. <laughs> and that we needed to know more about them. And also that there are so many others historically overlooked, marginalized, and in, in marginalized and a, uh, actively oppressed communities that we should have a way to celebrate them. So we've already heard this is the second year we have the unsung hero category. As we were putting that uh, together, we also had the idea that this would be a way to encourage new research and to find more co-op heroes. So we added funding to this project, right? There's small research grants available each year for people to identify and document achievements of historically overlooked cooperators with the objective of making a robust group of compelling and historically accurate applications from which an unsung hero could be selected. And such funds could be used, for example, to support students of color doing this kind of research to find examples of cooperators in their communities. I want to thank CDF and NCBA, their staff and boards, for thinking this was a good idea. I'm very excited tonight to recognize Mrs. Helena Wilson's induction to the Co-op Hall of Fame. She's an unlikely Shiro, and like most of Shiro's, she would say that she was just doing her job, and that all she did was do her best and try to make a difference. But now you've already seen and heard a lot about Mrs. Wilson. She was president of the International Ladies Auxiliary for 30 years, president of the Chicago chapter for many of those years, co-founder of the Brotherhood Buying Club in Chicago, co-founder of the Chicago Eye Clinic, which was opened by the labor movement in Chicago in the 40s. She helped to start the Brotherhood's Walker Credit Union in Montreal. And even more important, as, I, as we said, or I guess I said in the video, she started many co-op study groups so that she had people all over the country talking about and studying cooperatives and how we could be used. I do want to thank Tatiana Malvano, one of my former economics master's students who did the research to put together, to help us put together the application. And then I just want to end by saying, um, Mrs. Wilson worked with A. Philip Brandoff and on her own to promote cooperatives, to educate the porters, their wives, as well as the maids and other members of the union about how to start co-ops. She argued that not only does the labor movement need to understand and utilize co-op ownership to keep good union wages recirculating our communities, but also we need to teach our children about co-ops so that they can engage with the cooperative movement and learn about non-exploitative businesses. She brought the concept and practice of cooperative economics to many black communities around the country. 
She was a connector. She connected civil rights, labor rights, women's rights, consumer rights, and cooperatives. And while she helped to start a few cooperatives, she was really a co-op educator, right, and communicator. So the study groups, the num numerous articles, she was the main sp spokesperson for the B uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters on co-ops. And she was a heart and a hand person. So what do I mean by that? She was passionate about co-ops, spoke, wrote, and argued persuasively about their adoption and development. She raised the issue about the Brotherhood starting co-ops even when many of the Brotherhood's male leaders were skeptical or even opposed to it. She had guts, courage, and persistence, but she was also a doer, not just, it wasn't just the heart, right? She traveled around the country educating people, encouraging them. She helped to organize co-op conferences, joined committees, raised money, contributed money, um, and just made sure things happened, not that she would just talk about it. And finally, um, we know that she was unsigned because nobody, have you any of you heard about her except if you read my book? <laughs> 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 right? Um, you know, she is known in her circles as being part of the Ladies Auxiliary, but not known as a cooperative educator, not known as a cooperative um, leader. So she's mostly left out of co-op history until now. Um, but her example helps us see that everyday people can do this. She was a woman who started out with mutual aid societies. Her husband got a job, luckily, in the railroad, joined a union. But they were really ordinary working people, working class people. But she saw those connections, that ordinary people can connect with labor rights, with organized labor, can fight for economic justice, and do something to make the world better. Thank you all for recognizing a woman little known outside her circle, but a cooperator who showed us all the ways that cooperatives connect with other movements for social, economic, political, racial, labor, and gender justice. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Jessica. The next inductee, Linda Leakes. <laughs> Fought for housing justice in Washington, D.C., right here for 35 years. Please turn your attention to the video honoring Linda Leakes. Deploying the principles and strategies of cooperation, Linda Leakes fought for housing justice in Washington, D.C. for 35 years. A tireless activist, an organizer and a co-op educator, the quote, godmother of DC housing, helped hundreds of DC tenants become owners of their homes. Born in 1948 in Barnesville, Georgia, Linda spent much of her childhood caring for her mother and younger brothers. As a high schooler in St. Petersburg, Florida, she was unable to participate in many activities because of those family obligations. She enjoyed reading, but black children were not welcome at her neighborhood library. Finding the segregationist environment of Florida unbearable, Linda planned a move north, looking for a city with a predominantly black community. She chose, quote, Chocolate City, Washington, D.C. Linda arrived in D.C. in 1978 as gentrification threatened the homes of thousands of longtime black residents. She found an affordable apartment in a poorly maintained complex in the northeast quadrant of the city. The decrepit condition of her new home motivated her to start organizing. In 1982, she co-founded a collective house with three other black women. Known as the T Street Collective, 
the house became a hub of black feminist organizing. As she studied for a degree in mass media arts from the University of the District of Columbia, Linda worked as a janitor in a federal office building and later as an office administrator. She also completed a master's degree in community economic development from Southern New Hampshire University. In 1987, Linda secured her first job as a tenant organizer while seeking assistance for her own building. Washington Inner City Self-Help, or WISH, was formed in 1975 to protect a dwindling supply of affordable homes in the city. WISH organizers talked with Linda about limited equity housing co-ops, and she was quick to see the benefits. Soon after, Linda joined the WISH staff and began a career as a housing justice warrior. Linda focused on buildings with predominantly black residents. She advocated for tenants before DC City Council, demanding that landlords be cited and fined for neglecting their buildings. She encouraged tenants to take the fight right to landlords' neighborhoods, organizing demonstrations to shame them where they lived. Working with tenant groups with names such as The Last Holdouts and We Shall Not Be Moved, Linda educated residents about their right of first refusal and helped them form cooperatives to become owners. In 1989, tenants of Capitol View Plaza sought help from WISH through a federal housing program meant to encourage public housing tenants to become invested in their homes, Capitol View residents had been promised the right to buy their homes. A bit of their rent, they were told, would be held toward the purchase, but the opportunity never came and the program was canceled. Tenants were never informed. Linda stepped in. She helped members form an association and showed them how to force government officials to pay attention, even arranging for school bus rides down to government offices. Eventually, the tenants prevailed, securing $3 million in federal funding to rehabilitate their buildings. Renamed as Southern Homes and Gardens Cooperative, the co-op became the first housing cooperative in the United States formed by public housing tenants. As she worked to secure co-op ownership for tenants, Linda developed more than 30 educational programs to help renters transition to owners. Being a co-op educator was a role she treasured. I love that above anything else, she once said, to teach people how to own their own cooperative housing. Linda was also a co-op innovator. She imagined management and janitorial cooperatives to service the new co-ops and developed plans to create them. She helped form a co-op for social justice advocates called the Ella Jo Baker Intentional Cooperative. It's where she lives today. In 1992, Linda traveled to Johannesburg to begin her life's proudest work, supporting the development of the first post-apartheid housing cooperatives in South Africa. Linda and her colleagues helped the residents of seven buildings in three neighborhoods form cooperatives and buy their homes. Linda Leakes demonstrated the good that a serious, selfless, determined advocate can do in a needful community. Her strengths as an organizer, innovator, and co-op visionary secured the homes of hundreds of longtime DC residents. For working tirelessly on behalf of people she considered her neighbors and friends, we honor her with induction into the Cooperative Hall of Fame. I'd like to invite Ajawa Afateo and Michael and Priscilla Avery and Linda Leakes to join me on the stage for a few remarks. I can't see. Oh, okay, I need Linda, I need Priscilla, I need Michael, and I need Ajawa. Do we have? All right, all right. <laughs> so let's hire our Priscilla, Michael. We're gonna have them have the remarks first about you. Okay. Oh, oh, oh no, I'm sorry. Oh, Joel. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. You guys ready? Okay. 
So first of all, I just want to say that I was one of those first researchers for the Unsung Heroes. And, <laughs> and while I was doing the research, I kept thinking, well, Linda Leakes has done this and more. <laughs> I have got to put an application in for Linda Leakes. So <laughs> Linda Leakes is so unassuming and, you know, modest. I really had to sneak and do this application. Because <laughs> I felt like if I, if I told her, she was like, no, no, don't do that. You know, she doesn't think that, you know, what she does is that important. So we actually sneaked. Uh, Trisha Kent and I, <laughs> we went down to <laughs> the uh, Martin Luther King's People Archive, where which documents are, and went through those documents. and. Um, put this application in, and it was ex accepted. And we told Linda like, leaks about it after, <laughs> after she was already accepted, so she could not veto the process. <laughs> but I think it's important to acknowledge that this victory is not Linda Leakes alone. She will be the first to tell you that. In fact, when we told her, she was like, well, what about the people who did the work to start these co-ops. <laughs> Linda. <laughs> we can only find evidence of 16 co-ops, but we think it's more like 20 co-ops. Mm -hmm. And we only went by uh, you know, the information that people like Benito Diaz and Martha Davis and Roseanne Look and other people who, um, who knew about the co-ops, who worked with uh, Linda. And um, the documents in, in, in the archives. And so we found that um, we, we started on a number for 16 co ops. But, you know, Linda made it really clear that the people who did the work should also share in the victory. Absolutely. And that includes Benito Diaz and Martha Davis, Dominic Molden, all these people that worked at Washington Inner City Self Help, where Linda worked. And in addition, the people who started the co-ops, you know, the, yes. those 16 co-ops. So Linda really made it clear that they should be, you know, awarded to or, you know, sharing this award. And so I, I want to think, think that we have at least 22 people who are in the cooperative, housing cooperatives that Linda helped start here today. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that is that is thanks to Rochdale Capital, National Cooperative Bank, the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development, Ed Lazier, who helped with fundraising, One DC. Claude McCullum, a longtime friend in Louisville, Kentucky. And last but not least, the important work of Empower DC, who did a lot of work to make sure people could be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and so just a little about Linda Leakes, you know. She, she, I've been knowing Linda since I was 17, so like 50. <laughs> one years ago, and Linda Leakes helped me to learn, she taught me how to change a tire, because she said, <laughs> women need to know how to fix their own cars, because that's where a lot of stuff happens, right? <laughs> and though this woman is quiet and unassuming, she is ferocious. <laughs> Linda will go to a Klan march alone <laughs> with her sign. <laughs> you know, she okay. went to the Million Man's March the, when they said women shouldn't be there. Linda was there with a sign that said, stop misogyny. <laughs> Self-hatred. <laughs> so when it came to... <laughs> They didn't know what they were dealing with when they were dealing with Linda Weeks. 
She took those tactics to landlords. We talked about, we saw in the film that she went to their neighborhoods. Their wealthy neighborhoods would demonstrate, organize these demonstrations and all kinds of creative tactics to get people to pay attention to the works of, uh, the needs of poor people. She dealt with uh, like drug dealers who would try to occupy certain apartments. So they had to wade through the drug dealers. They had to set up protection and watches so that drug dealers wouldn't intimidate the tenants. Um, you know, a lot of banks didn't want to, uh, and Benita always tells this story, how some of the banks would say, you can't name that co-op after Malcolm X. <laughs> they had the money, so they would try to, you know, determine how, how these things would go. <laughs> But that, none of that. Um, oh, and so my favorite story is the Southern Homes and Gardens Co-op. And that was a housing co-op in Southeast DC. And they, the federal HUD had promised the residents that if they kept up the property, <laughs> that they could own these, um, these units. They could, turn, they could be homeowners. Well, they didn't you know, follow through on that um, promise. And so they went to Linda and said, could you help us? And so Linda did. It took 11 years. But you know, Evelyn Morse is here. is here today, and she tells that story. <laughs> there was a, a council of 12 organizers. And so she likes to tell, and we have this on a website that we set up for Linda Leaks called honoringlindaleaks.com. Ms. Morse said, Linda told them, I will work with you. I will help train you, but I will not do the work for you. So she had 12 people organizing, studying co-ops, studying how to be owners, studying the whole process, and they successfully got that building and turned it into one of the first housing co-ops, housing projects to turn into a co-op. Innovative. She demonstrated at HUD. She got um, DC <laughs> Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton on her side. Those tenants, you know, were out in the snow and the cold. They went to DC, uh, Baltimore, to speak on the radio. They waged a tremendous campaign. And you know, so Linda, she didn't do the work, but she taught them how to do the work. <laughs> And so, yeah, that was one of her crowning achievements. But there's lots more. And um, we just want to uh, just recognize that Linda is a revolutionary leader, a legendary housing co-op organizer. We welcome you, Linda. Thank you. for all of your hard work, seven days a week, helping tenants stay in their, their buildings and their property. And <laughs> Thank you, podium. <laughs> oh, thank you, everybody. My heroes, I appreciate and love. Thank you all for acknowledging the work that I did for so many years and so many hours. <laughs> many times without pay. <laughs> but we did it. And 
It's, that's just my heart. Thank you all. Just in my heart. Justice. That's what it's all about. And that's what kept me going. And we still have people living in the cooperatives that we worked hard, hard, hard to create. It was, not a, it was not an easy task. I know many, many days I was up 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning working with uh, residents to assist them in letting the mayor know, letting the council member know that injustice is something that we will not tolerate. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all. Our next inductee devoted her career to advancing cooperatives across sectors for 40 years, including transforming the landscape of cooperative philanthropy at the Cooperative Development Foundation. I guess folks know who this next inductee is, but I would like to take a moment personally to recognize Leslie's deep investment in home care cooperatives. <laughs> While at Cooperative Development Foundation, Leslie launched the annual Home Care Co-op Conference, the first convening taking place in 2016. <laughs> The conferences bring together key stakeholders connected to home care development, their growth and sustainability, and are a forum for attendees to work together on ways to advance the sector and to learn from each other. CHCA, my organization, has been a proud participant in each of the annual conferences and will continue to participate for many years to come because they are invaluable. Now, please turn your attention to the screen to see Leslie's video. If you ask Leslie Mead how much she loves public speaking, she will tell you, not at all. But if you ask her how to advance cooperatives and the people they serve, you will hear her voice loud and clear. Look for the people and sectors that need the most support and get them what they require to thrive. That principle guided Leslie's leadership of the Cooperative Development Foundation, where her careful stewardship attracted support from major new philanthropic sources. During her tenure as executive director, operating revenue increased by 64% and grant giving increased from $100,000 to $1.4 million annually in under 10 years. Like many cooperative leaders, Leslie grew up in the Midwest. She was born in Milwaukee, but grew up in Michigan City, Indiana. Her father, John, worked in manufacturing, and her mother, Lida, worked as a custom decorator and a travel agent. Leslie and her younger sister, Leanne, spent their summers at the beach on Lake Michigan, swimming, sailing, and riding bikes. At Elston High School, Leslie was known to get into trouble now and again, but she was also editor of the Crimson Comet. It was an interest she carried to college at Drake University in Des Moines, where she studied journalism. Highlights of her college reporting included coverage of the Pope's visit to Des Moines in 1979 and the 1980 Iowa caucuses. On her first day of law school at Indiana University in Bloomington, Leslie met a fellow student who intrigued her. 
Jeff Petrich was also from the Midwest, but he attended college on the East Coast and had perspectives that interested Leslie. The two quickly became friends, and then a couple. In 1986, they married. Their son, Paul, was born in 1997, and John came three years later. Leslie's work with cooperatives began in 1984, when she moved to Washington, D.C. to work for the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. Unfazed to be the only woman at her level, she quickly rose from Assistant General Counsel to Vice President for Legal, Tax, and Accounting Policy. As the scope of her work at NCFC grew, Leslie began to understand that the success of the cooperative movement depends on well-informed decision makers. Cooperative education became her area of expertise and led her next assignment as an independent consultant for NCFC, establishing a leadership scholarship program for the Ralph K. Morris Foundation. Later, Leslie became executive administrator for the Association of Cooperative Educators, a venerable but struggling organization with declining membership. Leslie helped reestablish ACE as a premier educational organization with unique cross-cultural offerings. In 2007, Leslie accepted leadership of the Cooperative Foundation, an organization founded in 1946 to support agriculture cooperatives in the Midwest. She became executive director of the Cooperative Development Foundation in 2014. One of Leslie's first actions at CDF was to organize the consolidation of multiple funds, including the Cooperative Foundation. It took careful diplomacy to convince advisory boards to release control of their beloved funds to CDF. But board members had come to know and trust Leslie's judgment. She persuaded them that combining efforts would lower administration costs and elevate the overall impact of CDF's investments. Perhaps Leslie's most consequential innovation at CDF is the National Home Care Cooperative Initiative. Home caregivers are among America's most vulnerable and poorly paid workers. The National Home Care Cooperative Initiative provides grants, technical assistance, and professional development to established and new home care co-ops and developers. CDF's annual National Home Care Conference has become an essential networking event for co-op members and developers. In one of her final actions as executive director at CDF, Leslie instituted a change to the Cooperative Hall of Fame itself, a new category to acknowledge the cooperative leadership of women and people of color. Ella Baker, known as the mother of the civil rights movement, was inducted in 2022 as the Cooperative Hall of Fame's first unsung hero. In retirement, Leslie has returned to her voracious reading habit she appreciates the time she has now to cook and to indulge in her new obsession, water aerobics. <laughs> she is glad to be able to fully enjoy the company of friends, especially the co-op coven, a small but mighty cadre of women cooperative leaders who have supported and advised each other for more than 30 years. For deploying a fierce intellect on behalf of the people and communities who benefit most from cooperative organization, for effecting profound change with a low-key but determined leadership style, and for ultimately transforming the landscape of cooperative philanthropy, we honor Leslie Mead tonight with induction into the Cooperative Hall of Fame. I'd like to invite Chuck Connor, Ann Reynolds, and Leslie Mead to join me on stage for a few remarks. We're going to have Chuck and Ann, your remarks first. dancing here on stage. <laughs> um, I'm Ann Reynolds, and I'm on the board of the Ralph K. Morris Foundation. I'm also a proud member of the Co-op Coven that you just uh, <laughs> heard about. And so in that role as both a colleague and a longtime friend of Leslie's, 
but really an admirer. I am just so happy to be here on behalf of the Ralph K. Morris Foundation to um, honor one of my heroes and yours, Leslie Mead. Thank you. Well, it is also my great honor this evening to help uh, induct Leslie Mead into the Co-op Hall of Fame. Um, as you have seen in the video, ladies and gentlemen, Leslie has been a, a staunch supporter of uh, co-op education and farmer co-ops, and she has left uh, really an impressive legacy uh, across many, many organizations that have been involved uh, with her through her uh, long cooperative career, almost exclusively cooperative career. This is especially true for her work uh, at my organization, the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, where she was uh, uh, willing to shift roles a bit and take on the challenge of integrating the uh, American Institute of Cooperation um, into the organization. And by doing so, she helped shape uh, NCFC's um, board education, training of our farmer owners in a way that uh, really is, is the legacy that con continues today. Um, Leslie, you, you have many, many uh, friends um, many people who love and admire you very, very much in this audience tonight. And so, so, ladies and gentlemen, in recognition um, of that unparalleled dedication, it is with immense pride that we induct Leslie Mead into the Cooperative Hall of Fame. Leslie, congratulations. I did it a little bit wrong the last time. I was supposed to give the plaque to the organizing, to the, um, to the organizations that we're nominating. So we're gonna do it right this time, okay? <laughs> That's the first thing, is to give the plaque to the Geez, I've been waiting my whole life to get up here in front of 400 people. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I'm mortified and humbled by this recognition, um, and, um, and particularly to follow Linda Leakes, who, what an inspiration. Um, when Pete Creer was inducted into the Hall of Fame. He said he felt like a turtle on a fence post, and I know that feeling right now. Um, I didn't get on this fence post without a lot of help from many people here tonight. Um, I'm fortunate to have family, colleagues, friends who contributed to much of what I've been praised for today. And I'd like to acknowledge some of those people here tonight. First of all, my mother, Lida Mead. <laughs> she, she, she and my dad believe that my sister, who's back here, um, Lee Wicks, and I could do anything we set our mind to. Um, Mom graduated from the University of Wisconsin in 1956. And, and like many women of her generation and gender, she faced significant gender discrimination when seeking employment. She was committed to making things better for her daughters. And during her lifetime, she was very active in the League of Women Voters and uh, was uh, active in getting the Equal Rights Amendment passed in Indiana, of all places. She was not one to be confined by gender roles, and she would rather have a glass of wine and read a book than fix dinner. So we <laughs> ate out a lot. Um, my, my father, uh, 
is deceased, but there is no one in the world who would have been more proud of me than my father, John Mead. Um, another important non-co-op contributor to, to you know, my, my uh, ability to do what I have done for, for cooperatives is my husband, um, uh, Jeffrey Petrick. Uh, Jeff has contributed to more co-op causes than he <laughs> has any idea about. <laughs> um, He, he's a loyal and loving partner with a real keen sense of, of fairness that um, has helped ground me. Um, I remember one time early in my uh, career coming home from work and venting my frustrations about uh, and irritation about my coworkers. And uh, <laughs> it, it might have been, but. <laughs> Uh, Jeff listened for a while, and then he said, don't fight with your own team. <laughs> and those words have stu struck with, stuck with me throughout my professional and my family life. Um, <laughs> we have two wonderful sons, uh, Paul Petrick and John Petrick. <laughs> They've attended cooperative preschool. <laughs> they attended to the Wisconsin Farmers Union uh, co-op camp that Yay! Kathy... <laughs> um, they have patiently visited countless uh, food co-ops on family road trips. <laughs> and they have stuffed CDF race... Uh, they have staffed the CDF race and uh, stuffed uh, Hall of Fame badges in their career. So uh, they... <laughs> Paul is a grocer, and at some time in the future, I hope he becomes a co-op grocer. So. <laughs> um, another person I'd like to acknowledge here tonight is Kathleen Donovan. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen um, Donovan chaired the Arlington Unitarian Cooperative Preschool, which my kids attended, and I might have been vice chair or something um, during that time. Um, and while cheering the, the co-op, Kathleen had two small children and was managing a challenging and high-profile profi job in the county. And as you know, at times, co-op leadership can seem like a uh, never-ending, thankless task. <laughs> um, but, but Kathleen handled it with grace and humor she showed me how effective biting your tongue and smiling um, can be when you're dedicated to a bigger cause, right? It's not all about you. Um, so thank you, Kathleen. Um, I had no intention of spending my career in cooperatives. Um, I didn't know what a cooperative was when I got was interviewed for the job at NCFC. Um, but I was fortunate to have mentors and allies throughout my career that made my work more than a job. Um, Jim Krzminski, who is here um, in the front, front row, um, <laughs> was my boss at the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives and was key to my uh, career in cooperatives. He imparted an understanding of the social, economic, and legal backgrounds of farmer cooperatives, and he instilled a rigor of cooperative law and advocacy in me. I've relied on Jim's strong foundation of cooperative, I, I've relied on Jim's strong foundation in everything that I have done in my career, and I can't thank him enough. Uh, William Nelson is also here, and William played a similar role in my transition from cooperative policy to education. William mentored me in the world of cooperative education and philanthropy. 
He modeled inclusion and kindness and always was available to talk through an idea. The CHS Foundation, which he headed, provided important grant support to numerous cooperative education activities at very critical times. There were many pleasures um, about going back to the cooperative, going back to work full time at the Cooperative Development Foundation. And among them were working with Judy Z. Watts, Rich La Rochelle, and Doug O'Brien. They were supportive colleagues willing to think the best of people. And that's a virtue that I sometimes need to be reminded of. <laughs> um, I also cherished my time working with Cassie Duran and Kirsty Boyette. <laughs> Much of what was accomplished at CDF was because of the creativity and dedication of Cassie and Kirsty. They performed far beyond their pay grade and deserve uh, recognition tonight. There weren't a lot of women working in agricultural cooperatives in the 1990s. That might surprise you. Um, and to help us, those few of us that were out there, um, negotiate the cooperative world, we began seeking each other out at conferences and meetings and phone calls and whatever. And somewhere along the lines, we started calling that network the Co-op Coven. <laughs> and there are people who have identified as the Co-op Coven for a while, there are people who didn't realize that they were members of the co-op coven, but were. Um, and you know, the coven provided a place to float ideas, give critical feedback, discuss career opportunities, and uh, have a few adult beverages. Um, over the years, many of the coven participants became co-op leaders and were able to support and mentor um, others. So I'm, I'm really proud of the work that the women in this room have done to advance themselves and other women and, and to advance the role of, of cooperatives. Um, and we've had many allies in that work along the way. Um, Of the work that, that I'm most proud of um, and has been referenced tonight is the work that I've done, uh, we've done with the um, home care cooperatives. Um, there is not a more um, satisfying a, a group to work for and, and, and really not a, 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 a better cause. And I'm hoping that this organization, cooperatives generally will continue to support this effort. Um, and uh, Sheldon's going to be up here uh, for, for years. We've had a... Um, the, the home care conference, and that conference has been at um, CFC, and they have treated um, us like the most honored guests, and people have, I, I, you know, the participants in that conference have, have really um, appreciated it. So thank you, um, CFC. <laughs> So tonight I feel as though about half the banquet hall should be up here on the stage accepting this uh, award with me. Um, the, connect, the, connect, the web, of, web of connections that we make is, value, is, is vital to cooperatives and our own well-being. Um, and I think we should recommit ourselves to expanding that and maybe expand, and expanding that to people who we might not think of including. So um, I th thank you for this award and good evening.
Thank you, Leslie, for your remarks. Our next inductee's unwavering dedication and leadership strength in rural electric cooperatives. Please turn your attention to the screen for the video honoring Sheldon Peterson. Sheldon Peterson devoted a career spanning almost half a century to the improvement of rural electric cooperatives and the people they serve. A humble but determined leader, he piloted the National Rural Utilities Cooperative Finance Corporation for 26 years with a steady compass set towards service. As CFC grew in financial strength and stature, Sheldon held to a guiding principle. It's more important for CFC to be good than to be big. It was an orientation grounded in the values of rural Iowa, where success comes from considering the common good and taking the long view. His perspective yielded impressive results. During his tenure, CFC assets burgeoned from seven to $27 billion. It took four days for news of Sheldon's birth in 1953 to reach his father, who was deployed in the mountains of Japan during the Korean War. Upon his return, the family settled in Irwin, Iowa, population 425. Small town life suited Darwin and Wanda Peterson. They knew their children, Sheldon, Curtis, and Beth would be cared for by trusted neighbors. Sheldon met the love of his life in eighth grade when his family moved to Lake City, population 1900. He was happy to be assigned a seat just behind a pretty girl named Anita Jane O'Toole. The two became friends and were soon dating. Eight years later, they were married. Sheldon and Danita recently celebrated their 49th anniversary. You could say a career in power delivery was inevitable for Sheldon. His father worked for an investor-owned utility for 41 years. His father-in-law served on two electric cooperative boards. Hearing their stories about how the lights came on in rural America helped set Sheldon on his path. Sheldon attended the University of Northern Iowa and graduated with a degree in marketing in 1975. He began his cooperative career a year later as a staff assistant at Nishnabotna Valley Electric Cooperative in Harlan, Iowa. In 1980, Sheldon became a manager at Rock County Electric Cooperative Association in Janesville. He interviewed for the position while en route to a fly-in fishing trip in Northwestern Ontario. He says the new job was his best catch of the trip. Early in his career, Sheldon became intrigued by the work of CFC's area representatives who provide financial management assistance to rural cooperative members. The idea of traveling around the country to learn from and advise electric co-ops appealed to Sheldon. He joined CFC in 1983 and began his traveling life. His circuit included cooperatives in Montana, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the Dakotas. The work revealed a truth that would later guide his leadership. Co-ops succeed when they stay true to their purpose, improving the lives of member owners. In 1990, Sheldon moved to CFC's headquarters in Washington, D.C., where he took a series of positions that prepared him for his promotion to CEO in 1995. As they planned their move east, the Petersons wanted to find a community similar to the one they were leaving behind. So they bought a home in the Virginia countryside. For a while, it meant a long commute for Sheldon until CFC's headquarters were moved to Dulles, Virginia. As CEO, Sheldon established a strategic vision for CFC as electric cooperatives, most trusted financial resource. That meant always being there for electric co-ops, no matter the condition of the markets or the economy. Implementing a broader vision meant garnering support from Wall Street by persistently telling the co-op story to major investors and securing their support. Sheldon expanded the influence and reputation of all cooperatives. With reinforced resources and a clear mission, Sheldon's team at CFC worked to strengthen existing co-ops and support developing ones. Sheldon is especially proud of CFC's support for America's newest electric cooperative, 
Kauai Island Utility Cooperative to promote cooperative education among the next generation of leaders in rural America, Sheldon expanded allocations to CFC's educational fund. He also directed increased resources toward the development of electric cooperatives in remote communities around the globe. Sheldon retired from CFC in 2021. He and Danita enjoy traveling and spending time with their four grandchildren. While he has given up his motorcycle, he enjoys riding his bicycle around Lake Anna, which was built in 1972 by an electric cooperative. Sheldon Peterson is the 2022 recipient of the prestigious Clyde T. Ellis Award, honoring exemplary contributions to rural electrification. Tonight, we honor this visionary cooperative leader again with induction into the Cooperative Hall of Fame. I'd like to invite Andrew Don and Sheldon Peterson to join me on the stage for a few remarks. Good evening. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming this evening. I know it's a great honor for Sheldon to be here. I'm Andrew Don, uh, current CEO of uh, CFC, and uh, more importantly, though, uh, the successor to Sheldon as the CFC CEO for 26 years. I had the pleasure of uh, working with Sheldon for 21 years, so I got to see firsthand uh, all his contributions, the significant contributions he made to the electric cooperative sector goes without saying, it was a great video, nice trip down memory lane for Sheldon and his family, I think. But um, you know, on a more personal note, um, again, what I, what I saw in my experience with Sheldon and his contributions to the sector and to uh, the cooperative business model, and our key values and in our mission statement is uh, commitments to service, integrity, and excellence. And I saw that every single day, Sheldon's commitment to service, service to the members, always being there, traveling wherever he had to go, commitment to excellence, delivering financial products, uh, meeting all the needs of cooperatives across the country, helping them uh, thrive and do well, bringing uh, economic development in rural America and integrity, without a doubt. Uh, Sheldon is certainly uh, has the strong, one of the strongest integrity of everybody I've seen, always did the right thing for cooperatives, always did the right thing for CFC. So without a doubt, well-deserved induction. And again, it's a privilege and honor to be able to induct you, assist in your induction into the Hall of Fame tonight. So congratulations, Sheldon. It's been a real privilege working with you. Um, I, I was given the privilege of serving as the N MC of this uh, August event several years ago, and uh, you know, that was nice. Um, <laughs> I got to tell you, this is a lot more fun. <laughs> you know, I, I do want to say uh, thank you to CDF, uh, first of all, for this wonderful celebration of our cooperative values. I, I am so grateful to have been selected to join a group of very, very accomplished cooperators. I, I will tell you that when I sat in the audience and I really listened to the stories of, of the folks that uh, are in this inductee group this year and realized the struggle, the challenges, and the accomplishments that are all done through the cooperative values and the cooperative program is pretty humbling, to say the least. Um, I want to thank, uh, by the way, I, I also want to just say congratulations to the other inductees. Uh, uh, my uh, hat is off to you and, and uh, job well done. I, uh, I want to thank Andrew and uh, Brad Captain and, and Rick Taylor at CFC who did the hard work to uh, to make the application uh, for my inclusion in the in the uh, 
Hall of Fame, it's greatly appreciated. As all of you know so well that virtually anything that's accomplished in our industry that is of significance is because we were part of a team. And this is where it's gonna get challenging. <laughs> I first started working on my first team when I was 16. Uh, took me five years to close a deal. <laughs> but we got it done. Uh, and that's marrying my beautiful wife, Donita. <laughs> she has been my partner, she's been my cheerleader, she's been my reality check. Uh, but most of all, she's been there every step of the way uh, of this journey. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, she is one of the most staunch supporters of the cooperative business model you'll ever find or talk to. Um, it also, uh, she actually played a very key role, I think, at CFC. CFC is known as a very family-friendly company and uh, takes a lot of work to do that kind of thing. And she's the one that did the work and uh, started that approach. <laughs> And of course, there was a point in time where we jointly decided to expand our team. <laughs> and uh, the results of us expanding our team were my beautiful daughters, Kate Peterson, Kristen Peterson Evans, <laughs> Leslie, our girls were going to co-op meetings before they could walk. <laughs> and as you can see, they're still coming to co-op meetings now. <laughs> and they can relate to you what it's like to take care of business on vacation. So I, I, I can understand exactly what you're saying. I'm just extremely proud of these two accomplished ladies. And you know, my job did require a lot of travel across the country and uh, they were very, very understanding on those occasions where dad had to miss something, but they were always there for me. Um, expanding further on the teams that I've worked with, of course, are the members of the CFC senior team that were present uh, under my tenure as CEO. You know, uh, some of them are here tonight, and if I start naming names, you'll throw me off of here. But I will tell you, this was uh, some of the finest individuals I've ever worked with. We worked together, we grew together, just incredibly creative and innovative people, and also people that didn't mind kind of leveling me out on occasion as well. It's been a tribute to work with them. Uh, a multitude of staff members at CFC. It's interesting how the staff members at CFC are not necessarily coming from a rural background. People come from all different works, uh, ways of walks of life and, uh, and business uh, backgrounds. And it's just interesting just to sit and watch people attach themselves and grab on to the co-op mission and the purpose of CFC and they become real troopers in that regard. Um, at CFC, we have a board of 23 individuals. One of the unique features of CFC, our board members can only serve six-year terms. That's two three-year terms. And as a result of that, as you might expect through my 37-year tenure at CFC, I went through a lot of board members. <laughs> but I can tell you to a one, they have been professionals in every stretch of the word, in the electric utility industry, professionals who are come from a background where they know the needs of the members extremely well, and they're professionals that all fully grasp and understand our commitment to the cooperative mission. Um, I can tell you that uh, they have been mentors to me. Uh, I've gotten significant guidance over the years, and that was all the way up to the day I retired. And I appreciate the knowledge and the connection I've had with them. Uh, one unique feature of electric cooperatives is the group of uh, co-ops of co-ops. In other words, the service organizations that have been formed within the electric cooperative industry to provide services such as legislative uh, services and, and uh, employee benefit services like NRECA, uh, technology services like NRTC. It goes further to insurance and material supply and data processing and also finance which is the role that CFC plays as a co-op of co-ops. 
working with these folks has been an inspiration. We have had the same values. We've had the shared successes as well. And it has really been enriching. But it just goes to point out the benefits of cooperation kind of compound themselves. And, and I honestly can say that with the help of this particular group of co-op co-ops, plus our regular uh, local distribution cooperatives, economies of scale have been developed and I feel capabilities exist within our industry that can rival any corporation in America today. Um, <laughs> There are roughly 900 electric distribution co-ops, the one with the meter on the house, as well as generation and transmission cooperatives that provide electricity to them. Um, they have a real sense of community, and I can tell you it builds on itself. They have challenged us at CFC. They've evolved with us at CFC. They've grown with us at CFC. But most importantly, it's these members that constantly remind you that what we're doing is all about that member at the end of the power line out there. And so I stand here today just profoundly appreciative of the opportunity to be part of this organization uh, with such a fantastic mission and purpose. And I also tell you, I've had a lot of fun along the way as well. Um, REC's, as all, all of you I'm sure know, were born out of a need. It was a need that existed in rural America for electricity because nobody else was going to do it, including my father's power company. Um, the reason they weren't going to do it is because it just didn't make economic sense. Uh, but quality of life uh, does make sense. And that's what really spurred the development of electric cooperatives with a nice boost from the federal government as well. But Rural America needed a business model that could actually focus on service, focus on the people that had a need. They needed a business model that would include local ownership, local control, local commitment, and they needed hope. And that's where the co-op model came in. And I stand here today so proud of our industry, which I believe is wildly successful in meeting the growing needs of rural America uh, continue to facilitate the growth in, in rural America and really are the excellence in the business of hope. Um, as you move forward, you will watch electric cooperatives be innovators on the forefront of innovative generation, grid reliability, energy management, communications, all that's required to continue to serve that member in the future. And again, all done with local control, uh, local commitment, and uh, the cooperative business model. Um, I guess all of that means to me that I think the cooperative business model truly is the model of the future. There are so many things we could do as organizations. There's a lot of need out there. It's just a matter of taking the action locally to make sure it happens. So thank you uh, for including me. Uh, thank you to all the people that uh, have provided me support and help for all of these years. Uh, thank you for the passion in this room for the cooperative business model. And I will just tell you, I'm just extremely grateful for having the opportunity to spend my career in a work world that really has an important purpose, working with people that have so much passion for what they do. Uh, it's been fantastic, and this is just a, a wonderful way to cap off uh, what I think has been just an incredible journey. And uh, thank you for including me in the group. CDF, th thank you for everything that you do, and uh, keep it all going. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sheldon. And last but not least, devoted to the prosperity of his membership and well-being of his community, innovation and passion were the stalwarts, were the hallmarks, 
my apologies, of our next inductee's career. <laughs> Please turn your attention to the screen for the video honoring Maurice Smith. Maurice Smith is known in the credit union community as a gifted statesman who is guided by his conscience and his faith. For 43 years, he set the standard for leadership through service, showing thousands of North Carolinians the way to financial security through cooperative membership. Maurice recently retired as CEO of Sister Credit Unions, Local Government Federal Credit Union, LGFCU, and Civic Federal Credit Union. The story of how he came to lead two credit unions is one of a caring and responsive cooperator called to seek the betterment of his membership and his community. Born in 1957, Maurice Smith grew up in Southport, North Carolina. He is the oldest child of James and Rebecca Smith and the brother of three sisters, Sharon, Julie, and Gina. The Smiths were vegetable farmers, growing produce to sell locally. The wisdom and example of his father, combined with the tenets of agricultural life, formed the foundation of Maurice's character. James Bubba Smith directed Maurice to choose a purposeful path early in life. So, at age 12, Maurice decided to become a bank president. His father began to prepare his son for a life of accomplishment and service. On the first day of freshman year at UNC Wilmington, Maurice met his future wife, Diane Gilbert. It was love at first sight for Maurice, and they married in 1981. Their son, Maurice Ravel Smith II, was born in 1988. Raven Catherine Smith was born two years later. Mindful of his promise to his father, Maurice secured a banking job after college, but he quickly realized that a traditional banker's path held no meaningful purpose for him. Instead, he became a loan officer at State Employees Credit Union. Maurice began his cooperative career by listening and learning. He recalls arranging a $100 loan for a family to buy enough food to last until payday. In that moment, he recognized a resonance between the cooperative way of doing business and the values of his father. Maurice joined LGFCU in 1992 as executive vice president. During his early years, he pursued a law degree, working nights, weekends, and holidays. It was a quest he describes as a divine ordering of his life, a necessary step toward an impactful life. The law degree prepared him for his later leadership roles at LGFCU, first as president in 1999 and CEO in 2017. Under Maurice's leadership, LGFCU became the fourth largest credit union in North Carolina, with 400,000 members and assets exceeding $3.5 billion. As his credit union grew, Maurice stayed personally connected to staff and members alike. He interviewed every new hire and accepted calls from any member who wanted to tell their story. Responsive innovation was a hallmark of Maurice's career. He proposed a sister credit union called Civic that would operate solely through digital channels. The novel idea, now a national model, made membership expansion possible, including 600 new accounts for first responders. Connection to community was another leadership value for Maurice. He built partnerships with the UNC's School of Government and the North Carolina State Firefighters Association. In 2021, LGFCU and Civic created a foundation to support local housing, healthcare, and food nonprofits. When hurricanes ravaged the state, Maurice persuaded LGFCU's board to donate $100,000 toward disaster relief. Maurice generously shares his expertise, serving on multiple industry and community boards. He was the first African-American chair of CUNA's Board of Directors. He served as chair of National Cooperative Bank and director of the African-American Credit Union Association. He is a trustee of his alma mater and is a deacon of Wake Chapel Church in Raleigh. At CUNA, Maurice made a proposal he hoped would breathe new life into the cooperative movement. 
and eighth cooperative principle of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The CUNA board embraced the idea, and it is now under review by the International Cooperative Alliance. Maurice is the 2020 recipient of the Herb Wegner Award for Outstanding Individual Achievement and the 2019 Pete Creer Lifetime Achievement Award. This year, he was named to the Order of the Longleaf Pine Society, North Carolina's greatest honor. Predictably, Maurice is methodical about retirement. He divides his time into three parts, continuing service to credit unions, providing legal advice to advising religious and nonprofit groups, and traveling with Diane to photograph wildlife. Guided by the wisdom of his father and motivated by a desire to seek economic opportunity for all, Maurice Smith improved the lives of thousands of North Carolinians. Tonight, we thank and salute him with induction into the Cooperative Hall of Fame. I'd like to invite Mike Mercer and Maurice Smith to join me on the stage. Mike, your remarks. Is anybody glad that this was the last one? <laughs> There could be 100 people in this room that could stand here and do what I'm about to do, which is to help all of us recognize Maurice Smith for his contributions to credit unions and cooperatives. Hopefully, I can channel you other 99 effectively. <laughs> Right now, Maurice is wondering, why me? We all say that, don't we? <laughs> he really means it. He is a man of faith. He believes that we are a small part of something much bigger. Maurice considers family the bedrock of society and he views credit unions as an extension of family. <laughs> Maurice also knows that credit unions are part of the cooperative way of doing business. To Maurice Smith, co-ops exist to help people contend with their lives, solving their problems. And he views life to be best explained in the context of a conversation at the kitchen table. Maury Smith is a pillar of integrity. He's a consummate cooperator. He is optimistic about the future. And he's a friend to everybody, and I mean everybody, that knows him. Maurice will give credit to everyone but himself. I know that his father and his mother had great influence on Maurice, but he and I will give most credit to his remarkable wife, Diane. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome Maurice Smith into the Cooperative Hall of Fame. sense the urgency of getting out of here. So, so I'm not sure how this happened. 
Um, it just seemed like just a few short years ago, I was a skinny kid, you know, alone, trying to be a loan officer at a credit union and figure out the rule of 72 and all this sort of thing. <laughs> and just a real quick 44 years later, here we are. And so, uh, so congratulations to my fellow inductees. And when I hear your stories, absolutely, absolutely. I am inspired by your stories and your journey and what you have done. And when I hear what you've done and I see your credentials and I see your work, I feel like such a slacker. <laughs> <laughs> I really need to do something with my life one of these days. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's just absolutely amazing and inspiring to me. I, I wanna, wanna just pause first and, and in my way, you know, thank my father and my savior for gracing me with a life that I did not deserve. Yeah. So for some reason, Jesus sought fit to give me favor. And um, so I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank NCBA, CLUSA, and CDF for this event and an opportunity to stand before you. Um, some, of you some of my friends keep really, you know, close secrets, because I didn't see this coming. And so, uh, uh, we, we'll talk about that later. Um, so, so my life is a compilation of contributions from a lot of people, and I just want to spend a few, just a couple of minutes acknowledging a few folks and organizations, and then just some closing marks, and then get you out of here. And so, it's, it, you know, so Sheldon, I had to try to close a deal earlier. It took some time. <laughs> and so, um, so I want to thank my wife, Diane, for being my partner on this journey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So speaking of closing deals, it took a couple of years of stalking. I mean, asking her out several times before she, that didn't come out right before she would eventually go out, go out with me. And she had no empirical evidence whatsoever to give her some inclination how this was going to turn out. <laughs> In 20 days, we will celebrate our 43rd wedding anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. So, I wasn't taking the chance. I knew she was taking the chance, but <laughs> she, she, she great, gladly went along with that. I have, my, I have two of my sisters here with me, and uh, Dr. Julie Webb, and attorney Fred Webb is here. Thank you for your sacrifice to leave the office, to leave the practice, to leave your home, and come here and be a part of this occasion. Our baby sister, Gina, is here. Yeah. G Gina is a rocket scientist. She has high top secret clearances with the federal government. And when I asked her what she does, she said, I'll tell you, but I have to kill you. <laughs> so I stopped asking questions a long time ago. Uh, to my surprise, the senior pastor of my church arrived here today, Pastor Sharon Dean. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Accompanied by Bernadine Cobb, who is a senior vice president of State Employees Credit Union, and our youth pastor, Julian Cobb. So I, I'm honored that you would take time out to be a part of this. Mm. I have colleagues here from local government, Federal Credit Union, and Civic, led by CEO Dwayne Naylor. And I thank you for being here and representing the board of directors. We have, you know, Lynn and Judy Jones. Thank you for being here. I miss you guys, you know. <laughs> This staff here is responsible for serving the financial needs of city and county government employees and volunteers and elected officials in the state of North Carolina. And they do that with poise and dignity and accountability and responsibility. That's what we do as co-ops. And they, they represent all of you, the co-op family, very well. So I thank them for the tradition that they are setting for. There are others from North Carolina, the Carolinas Credit Union League folks are represented here, the Co-op Council of North Carolina, AACUC is in the house, the African American Credit Union Coalition. 
the, the National Cooperative Bank, on which I served on their board for a few years, and I appreciate that opportunity. Thank you, Casey and others. We have representatives here from Callahan and also from Inclusive, and so thank you all for your presence and being here and celebrating this evening. As you can tell, it took a, a whole village to raise me. In fact, <laughs> it took several villages, in fact. So a final comment I'd like to talk, sort of make to you. So we represent co-ops in a number of sectors, and um, what's common among all of us is our desire to serve mankind and our members, to help them live good lives. And so regardless of what sector, what industry that you're in, and regardless of where you're located, our members want the same thing. They want dignity. They want to be treated fairly. They want to be compensated fairly. They want a, they want a safe home to go to. They want the children to be able to play in the front yard and go to school and have a future for themselves. They want a clean environment. They want to have the things that everybody else have. And so in a politicized environment where there's, it's easy to sort of pick out what's different between lots of us, there's a whole lot of stuff that's common among us. And if we focus on the common things, it's easy, and, and the things that are different, they're going to always be different. Push them to the margins, off the table, and, just, and let's not worry about that. Let's focus on the things that we all agree on. And if we do that, we build better communities, better co-ops, and better members, better citizens. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. This has been um, a privilege of a lifetime. Thank you so much, Maurice. Okay. So don't you all agree that this is a terrific group of co-op heroes? <laughs> We salute all five of our 2023 inductees. The plaques commemorating tonight's inductees will join those of the past inductees in the Cooperative Hall of Fame and will hang in the NCBA, CLUSA, and CDF office here in DC. All of, the all of the videos and biographies of the 2023 inductees will be added to the Hall of Fame website at heroes.coop, which has been flashing across the screen as well. So you can see them um, at the website. And that brings us to the end of the program. Once again, our congratulations to all of the inductees and their families your leadership, dedication, and accomplishments inspire us all. And I would actually say, let's have a round of applause for everybody in here, because we can hear the stories of how everyone is connected. So just a bit of housekeeping. First, we ask that the inductees, their families, and other plaque recipients go to the First Amendment Lounge for photographs as soon as we adjourn. We'd like to have our first photo of the new inductees all together. On behalf of the Cooperative Development Foundation, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope tonight's program has renewed your commitment to the power of cooperatives and the good that they can do for people. We look forward to seeing you next year when we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Cooperative Hall of Fame. And it'll be at a new venue, the Hamilton Hotel, which is beautiful because I'm staying there. It's gorgeous. Save the date. It's October 3rd, 2024. Thank you, good night, and travel safely to your final destination. Thank you.